Welcome everyone. We will just give people a few minutes to trickle in and then we will get started. We've got a little bit of conversation in the chat. Wait until 6.02 and then we will get started. And Ty, you have a show, you have some slides to show, right? I just want to check before we go. Can't hear you, brother. Can't hear you. Yeah, I got a little sizzle reel, and then um, you know, I can you know talk about you know CTH in general, and then okay, um, I'll let you. Then, then you know, I was gonna ask. I was sorry. Thanks, brother. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, it's 6.02, why don't we get started? And I'm sure other people will be joining us as we go. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, just wanted to let you know before we dive into the lecture tonight that this program is being recorded, which I'm, saw, I'm sure you saw when you joined us. Um, and it will be available on the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum and the Classical Theater of Harlem's Facebook and YouTube pages, as well as dykemanfarmhouse.org after today, in case you need to replay it. Um, so welcome back to the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum's virtual lecture series, talking about race matters, join the conversation. I'm Meredith Horsford. I'm the executive director of the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. Uh, we are delighted to continue this lecture series that we began in August of 2020. And it was so successful that we've continued it as a biannual series. So thank you to those of you who are returning and welcome to our newcomers. This four week series, hosted in partnership with the Classical Theater of Harlem, centers around social justice and advocacy, how advocacy groups and arts and cultural organizations participate and lead in social justice movements. This series was created at a time of great unrest in this country due to the murder of unarmed black people, as well as the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal throughout has been to encourage people to come together and engage in conversation on a topic that can sometimes be uncomfortable. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few useful features on Zoom. Please use the chat box feature um, to say hello to other attendees and to ask Melissa, our Director of Development and Community Engagement, any technical assistance questions. During the lecture, if you have questions for our speakers, please click the Q&A button, which is kind of at the bottom of your screen, um, and we will answer those questions as we go. We at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum thank everyone for joining us this evening. We feel strongly that our programming remains free of charge so that it is accessible to all. The response to this lecture series has been overwhelming and there is clearly a need for us to talk more about the issues that divide us and the issues that unite us as Americans. As a small nonprofit organization, we rely on grants and donations to support these programs. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Honorable Udonis Rodriguez, New York City Council District 10, and former Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Additional funding is provided by TD Bank. If you would like to make a donation to help us continue our community-focused programming, it is greatly appreciated. In lieu of donations, we are also selling some really cool Dykeman Farmhouse Museum merch. Melissa has shared the links for you in the chat. A purchase supports our cause, furthers research, and provides educational programming. Tonight, we are joined by Ty Jones, 
producing artistic director of the Classical Theater of Harlem, and Michael Dinwiddie, associate professor of dramatic writing at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at New York University. The arts are the perfect forum to codify, message, and act upon the needs of a community. Together, Ty and Michael will moderate a discussion centered around the intersection of art and social justice. Seeking to uphold their founding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, their goal is to foster community maintenance through art and conversation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ty and Michael presenting Courageous Conversations. Wow, thank you, thank you Meredith. Thank you, that was uh, very humbling. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I'm even more humbled to have uh, uh, Michael Dinwiddie with us. Um, truly uh, one of the people who, upon whose st shoulders we stand in terms of every aspect of theater making, whether it's playwriting, directing, or even the academic uh, aspect of it. So Michael, thank you for, for being a part of this. This is, uh, you, you make the world a better place. Well, thank you, Ty, for inviting me. And I'm delighted that we're gonna have this conversation. We never have time to just sit and talk. So this is yeah. really great. And especially, you know, I've, I've been a big fan of yours since I saw you perform at the Classical Theater of Harlem in the Blacks many years ago when oh, your, <laughs> your career was on the stage. And now your career is making the stage for others. So can you talk to us a little bit about your involvement with Classical Theater of Harlem? And maybe you have some, some images and ideas you want us to share before we get into our conversation. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'll try to do it really quickly. So I, I auditioned for CTH in around 2003 or so. Um, was cast in that production you talked about, The Blacks. Um, and then at that point, um, you know, some folks would say that I became sort of the, the, uh, uh, a mainstay in many of the productions after that. So I did about 12 productions after that. And then uh, we hit the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, we had a deficit of leadership as well as a, a financial deficit of uh, $400,000. Uh, everybody on the board pretty much left. All the poor people stayed. And, um, but I knew that the previous 10 years, you know, actors like myself um, love to do these plays by Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, Shaw, Congreve, Sheridan, you name it. And um, uh, I did not want to see that go away. And so that's when I stepped up and, uh, and tried to do everything I can to, to salvage the company. And, um, and we've had some good fortune. We are no longer in debt. The $400,000 debt has been retired. Um, and, uh, and I think my, my goal is something that's not sexy. It's just sustainability. How do we make sure uh, that this place is around for the next 100 years? So, um, you know, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, patience is what has to be employed. Um, and of course, constant um, friend, uh, making, enrolling folks, and, and my perspective of enrolling people is through the arts. Come see our shows. If our shows, if we can't enroll you through our shows, say la vie, totally understand. There's tons of other theater in New York City, but um, I'm hoping that it's through the art that we can have these sort of courageous conversations. And I, I, I like that you pointed out, you know, about what's happened over the past two years, because I think that institutions, large and small, have, start, uh, have, have, have tried to sort of assert their relevance and commitment to social justice. You know, you've seen it in the New York Times or the Garden or Guardian or the Washington Post, and they, and they flood articles um, about industries that vow to better serve the community. Now, you know, I guess that could be looked at as social progress, but, you know, there, I think people like you, Michael, I think, you know, organizations like CTH who've been doing this work for years, um, I, I think it's fair to say that I'm, I'm kind of concerned that this moment, you know, will be left with empty gestures. So that's why I want to keep these conversations going. And, and uh, I, I believe that art can uh, uh, drive these conversations just like it did 100 years ago with the Harlem Renaissance. I mean, we're talking about black folks who were under siege. They didn't have uh, you know, political representation. They didn't have, you know, quote unquote, health care. But they had to look to each other and, and trust in one another uh, to make sure that they eventually uh, you know, got Harlem Hospital. They eventually got the political representation in Adam Clayton Powell. So I kind of feel like that Harlem specifically and, and other innervated communities are, are going to have to do the same thing. They're so, it, it, well, I'm, I'm watching, uh, you know, people unplug, you know, from the, the central way that we've all, um, we've all, we've all, you know, done business and they have to sort of look to each other in much smaller ways uh, to be able to be the contributing citizens that, that they should be. So 
Well, you know uh, what? I'm going to say that you have just given a, I mean, you know, the exegesis you just laid out is so incredible. But what I want to say, the one thing I want to do is say, you didn't just, you didn't just step up. You came with a vision, with a level of creativity that has led this organization and created a whole synergy around theater in Harlem and the community and embedding the classical theater of Harlem in that community. So I want you to talk about that a little bit, but I also want you to talk about all the different programs that classical theater of Harlem sure. does. Sure, so um, thank you for that. And um, you know, I, 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 and this is something that I need to pick your brain about a little bit too. So you remember the We See You White American Theater came out? Oh yeah, sure, so sure, I, sure. I wanna talk to you about that specifically, but I remember when it came out and I gotta tell you for me, um, uh, with or without that letter, if you want to make progress, you got to name the thing that's in your way. Right. Um, and I just felt like, you know, no names, you know, were actually put out there. I understood all of the situations and the circumstances that were talked about, but I did not see any way to practically put things in the place um, for accountability. Right. So um, I've always been of the mind that I don't care how liberal you are. And I do believe that there's some John Brown, you know, allies out there, but I don't care how liberal you are. I don't believe that one is going to displace themselves in the name of diversity, equity and inclusion. Right. right. So uh, what, what tends to happen is that, you know, you sort of pluck certain people out and you get them to come to the fancy institutions and, um, you know, the rest is history. And I'm just of the mind that we got to be OK with sort of creating our little own corner and um, uh, uh, in the world, at least in, in the arts world, creating our own little corner, black folks should be able to do that in such a way without necessarily looking to these big, large institutions as the superlative that we need to you know, reach up to and things of that nature. So that, that's, the, that's what I wanna be able to create. But so you're doing uh, it. And what's interesting yeah. about what you're doing is it's not a little corner. It's all of American culture and history and our traditions. The fact Ibsen belongs to all of us. Yeah. Shakespeare belongs to all of us. Classical Theater of Harlem does original work. You create work with new playwrights. You create yeah. work out of the community. And you also make it possible for people in the community to train in the theater. You make it possible for them to work backstage and do all these things that these are not an opportunities. I mean, we've had the American Negro Theater in the 1940s. We had Negro yeah. Ensemble. We had different times, periods. But Classical Theater of Harlem has its staying power. I mean, because of people like you who've been so totally committed to making sure that it survives, that it really thrives. I, I, I say that's the thing. And so, so I just wanna think about what does it offer to the Harlem community that, that no one else does? What does classical theater of Harlem offer? Well, I, I, I kind of like to think that we're just part of the fabric. I don't wanna think that we're unique or special or stand out, but I will say this, in terms of uh, the art that we do, we're the only theater company above 96th Street that does classics, new plays, musicals and revivals. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone else above 96th Street that does that. So I'm and proud you left to out something. You left so out sorry? something. You left out something. You left out that you do free Shakespeare in the park. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, I, you, know I, I, you were correct. We do that uptown as well too. Uh, you know, um, and, uh, uh, and I'm thankful that the reason why we've survived is because of the people. Yes, we've gotten some grants from some um, organizations like the Ford Foundation and Gilman um, and, and New York Community Trust and J.L. Green were deeply, deeply thankful and our political support and things of that nature. However, um, it, none of that matters unless the people have said, yeah, you matter, you know what I mean? So I feel lucky in that. And, 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 and I um, always say at the end of every show, whenever I you know, speak up, is like, if you all feel that we've earned a contribution, this is what you can do. Because in order for us to be able to pull all this stuff off, it does take a village. I need political support, I need individual support, I need local business support, other cultural institution support. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, I, I'm not trying to really solve anything, but if we can create a fertile ground for conversation through the arts, then I felt like I've done my job. Well, you know- And, and it's, I, cause it's never done, it's never done. Yeah, right, the job's exactly. never done. So I could do that to the day that I die. There's no real goal to get to, but, but the sustainability aspect of it is, is quite difficult. Well, you know, what's oh, interesting wow. to me, Ty, is that when I think about you, I think about, you know, you're an amazing actor. I've seen you on Broadway. I've seen you off Broadway. Those things, But I also know that you've had to really, in some ways, put that aside to be an institution builder. Yeah. And so there's always a sacrifice. There's always a kind of uh, decision 
of what I'm going to do to go forward and to help do make sure that others let have me, the opportunity you have. You're going, Michael. Right? Michael. So again, I deeply respect that you say that, but let 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 me add a little more color to that. No pun intended. Okay. Right? <laughs> Is that <laughs> um, about sacrifice? Let's put it. Let's put it this way. I have chosen to do what I'm doing, so I tend to um, shy away from the word sacrifice. Because sometimes I feel like the word sacrifice means I've lost out on something. And trust me, I am fulfilled with CTH. I am fulfilled being in this moment speaking with you. I am fulfilled with my three kids, one of them in the back doing homework right now. You know, I am. So there's not a part of me where I was like, man, I could have went, you know, on the West Coast and, and actually looked at all my friends who and I could be having a TV show. Nah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Um, now, I will say the last two years have been a bit of a, a challenge. That I ain't going to lie. But um, uh, with that said, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good where I am. I am. Well, that's what it takes. You know, I mean, that's, that's nation building. That's, what, that's yeah. what all artists who create have to do. They have to make the decision in time, but I'm going to make space for others as well. I mean, I think of, uh, you know, Amari, Amiri Baraka, you know, creating his space. I think of yeah. Woody King starting out as an actor, but creating yeah. the new kind of theater. I think yeah. of all these different... Uh, people who have had to figure out ways to make the space for others to do what they want to do. And then, yeah. now, one of the things that's really great to me about classical theater, Parliament, I'm getting feedback. I don't know if anybody else is hearing it. Are you hearing it? Just me. Okay. Good. Oh, yeah. um, good. good. One of the great things is that it's a professional theater. It's professional. Uh -huh. you, you, you know, Harlem's had other theaters. It had American Negro Theater, which became professional with, you know, Ossie Davis, Ruby D. Uh -huh. Time and all these amazing actors and everything. It only it lasted for a decade. Classical theater Harlem seems to have legs. In a way, it's really quite remarkable. And I think part of it is exactly what you said that it's of the community. It's really what does the shows. But here's my question that you're going to get and that you've gotten. I don't think you get any more. What are you doing all these classical plays for? Why, oh, cool. you know, why are you focusing just on the story, the black stories? What's going on up there? Yeah. What's so you to get downtown. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. So um, so this is how I think about classics. Um, I get it. Dead white guys. Why are y'all doing those plays? So on and so forth. But I think it goes back to what you said before. These are ours. These stories are ours. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I think that these stories are living arguments. They aren't just there are some people who treat them as some sort of superlative holy writ. And, you know, you can't change a word and all this other stuff. But I don't see that at all. So, for example, I'll give you uh, uh, something simple. Romeo and Juliet. I think most of us are taught that, you know, it's this sort of, you know, waif girl who, you know, wears white throughout the whole play and a pretty, you know, uh, uh, you know, boy who, you know, does his hair like this all the time or whatever. And it's about these two star cross lovers. But, you know, when you look um, uh, at the play itself and you read all of it, you know, they talk about two households, both alike in dignity in fair Verona with where we lay our scene. Right. And, they, and Verona is actually has walls around it. So you start to think, well, what, what is that about? that these households that are alike in dignity, but they have to be surrounded by walls. Romeo himself says, you know, I would rather, I would rather die in Verona walls than be banished outside of the walls. So what is that? What, is that the way ruling class people set themselves up? And then they do something so stupid with one another that their kids die. Yeah. You know, so there's a story that, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's so much can. more than just, you know, but soft, what light through yonder window, break. you know what I mean? But it gets painted that way. It gets Disney-fied that way. I think the same thing with, um, or a similar thing, not the same thing, with uh, Henry V. So Henry V, oftentimes the way that it's cut, it looks like Henry is uh, God's best friend. But when he does that so-called wooing scene, when you read the whole thing, he basically tells Catherine, if you don't do what I do, to, what I tell you to do, we're going to start this all back up again. She didn't really have a choice. You know what I mean? But you so make, they make it look like this. Uh, you're Sorry, talking about cultural literacy. You're talking yeah. about yeah. understanding that in these stories, we can find our stories. Our stories are their stories. Their stories are our stories. No such thing as that. I think about the production you, you that Carl Cofield directed, Seize the King, which we planned to bring to NYU to the Skirball Center, but COVID stopped that from happening. But I know that classical, you know, and, and Seize the King is a willpower project in which we look at Rich the Third but in a whole different way. You want to talk about that process, and what, how that came to be? Yeah, I mean, look, the truth is, is that came to be because of Carl Cofield and his relationship with Will Power. It really is that simple. Yeah. Uh, you know, Carl is um, an extraordinary partner, an extraordinary mm -hmm. director, 
And, yeah. um, and he literally said, hey, man, I've got this idea. What do you think? And I was like, I, I think it's a good idea. It, it, it's that simple. It was about the relationship. So um, we have Richard III, but yeah. the language of, the, of today, we have dance, we have music, we have Carl Colfield, who's now the uh, chair of the graduate acting program here at NYU next door to me. I'm so delighted to have him as my neighbor. And so we see Classical Theater of Harlem kind of spreading the message and the idea that Joe Papp in the 1960s started this idea that these roles, these ideas, this theater of really connecting with people is beyond tribal color, beyond, right. beyond the tribal sense. So, right. We, um, as a matter of fact, that's what we want to do. We want to, you know, without question, let folks know that we love the neighborhood in which we were founded. However, if we can, you know, build a a, a, a bigger national profile, this is something we want to do. And with that said. We are, you know, fingers crossed. I don't want to put it out there as for, for uh, 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 you know, public. I, I guess it is public consumption. Anyway, what we're trying to do right now is um, speak with Shakespeare Center LA with the possibility of uh, doing a show, Classical Theater Problem, doing a show there in uh, August and September. That's, that's what we're looking at. So we're in the middle of the talks right now. And we're, uh, as a matter of fact, this week, yeah, shoot, Friday, I have a conversation with a representative from Sweden about the possibility of uh, taking something internationally over there. Now, look, the truth is, these all could go away. But now that these conversations are happening, again, I'm somebody who believes that all progress begins with a conversation. So yeah. um, if they don't happen in 2022, maybe there's somewhere down the line, it will. Well, I saw um, the brilliant production of Cherry Orchard with Earl mm. Simon and, um, and, and, Pierce. and uh, Wendell Pierce and all those yeah. brilliant actors. And the reason I brought that up though is because Earl Hyman's major career was in Norway. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> So you're, yep. just returning to, you're just returning to Scandinavia with Classical Theater of Harlem. It's yep. not a new thing. And, I, and also National Black Theater is dealing with that part of the world as a, yes. well. So it's really, I just love the fact that our theater is starting to understand how it can be an engine for rethinking the culture. Um, yeah. You know, I live, I live at NYU down at Bleecker and Mercer Street, and that's where in 1821, the African Grove Theater was yeah. built, yeah. run by African-American uh, founded by African Americans, act, African American actors, and uh, it was 1821 that they were doing Shakespeare, they were doing musicals, they were doing original plays about Black rebellion. So yeah. this is you're in that tradition. I mean, we had this interruption of minstrelsy, but now we're back to really understanding that we can be on the stage how we want to be on the stage. And when I say that, I'm thinking about you gave a lecture at uh, your alma mater. Uh, you know, the Paul R. Jones lecture. Yeah. I want to talk about some of the points you hit in that, and then we'll go back into talking about uh, African-American theater today. Okay. Are there any specific points you want me to talk about? Well, the um, ones you, you, I, can, you, you I can tell you one that really stands out for me. So yeah. there's a book on Paul R. Jones. He is no relation to me. Uh, I was asked to be the uh, keynote speaker for a part of the University of Delaware, had a new college opening up, and I was asked to speak, <laughs> to be the keynote speaker, and Paul R. Jones was the subject. So um, I read his Paul book. Who was Paul R. Jones? Who was Paul R. Jones? Just so uh, he was a collector of black art. So he was the one, uh, he, you know, and he, he did it throughout his entire life. And he gifted it, part of his collection, I believe, to University of Alabama. But I think he gifted the majority of it to the University of Delaware. So anyway, um, what ended up happening uh, is that I, I read his, the, the book on him. And there's a foreword. And it was written by uh, Dr. David Roselle, who used to be the president at University of Delaware. And in the foreword, he said um, that uh, uh, Mr. Jones was unable to attend, I believe it was Alabama, uh, because of the color of his skin. And so in my speech, I said, no, it wasn't because of the color of his skin. It was because of the racist attitudes of the time. He came out of his mother's womb just as perfect as anybody else did. There was nothing wrong with him where the University of Alabama wasn't going to allow him to attend. So th this kind of language, I think, is always uh, sort of important to put, uh, to put out there. And I was glad that I was able to speak to that, because I think that really resonated with a lot of folks, because I think we all talk that way. We all talk that way about the first black to do this or the first woman to do that. And I wish it was like, due to the racist attitudes or to patriarch or whatever it is, this now we have the first woman because then we because then it, it, it talks about the progress hopefully of those who have been putting up the obstacles as opposed to somehow you know uh, uh there was some herculean effort by the woman or herculean effort by the the black person to get to where they were as if we had to aspire to reach those folks anyway 
now you're nailing it because what you're really talking about is the obstacles have been put in the way of social activism from white supremacy, from notions of tribalism that we have in our culture, in our country, that we are still trying to overcome. And we see it more and more. And I see classical theater Harlem as a place where it's being, the, the community is being nurtured by what you do and by what you produce. And it's, all, but you're also spreading the word. I love this idea, you're going to LA now, you're going to, you're looking at going to Scandinavia. But I mean, we we are the world. I mean, that's really, <laughs> we are the world, we are the- we'll Break out and soul. <laughs> you know, and so, so CTH is really a nonprofit. It's a nonprofit, but yeah. at the same time, you are thinking in a visionary way and a way to think about how can we really take care of our community, not only the community that we live in, but the community of actors, the community of yeah. the community of people of, who want to learn about the theater. Yeah, I got a bunch of ideas and they're all ideas right now because I need, you know, people with, you know, seven, eight figures in the bank to help out, right? But but I'll give you one of my ideas. Right now, you don't have yeah, to okay. right now. You're, gonna, you're gonna get everything well, you want. Don't worry. Look, let me t let me tell you the one idea I have. So during the uh, the last two years, um, my I have three kids. They were all in school. They struggled with online learning. I saw. The, the, but let me just say this: I, I know people who had it way worse than we did, especially mm -hmm. single parents. I know them personally. What they were going through when they had to go to work and their kids stayed home and their kid didn't stay online. Anyway, what ended up happening is that I uh, and and my team. Uh, uh, thought of a way to engage these kids. Uh, what, there, there's, a, there, there's a bunch of us, but I really want to acknowledge a, a young man named Andre Pardassi, Pardassi excuse me, because uh, I had been thinking about this and then he reignited it in me. But the idea is this, most uh, uh, young scholars, students uh, are watching anime. Apparently like 93% of their viewing is anime, right? So I was like, how can we get these fantastic stories? and put them in a way that engages them that can compete with their animation that they already watch. And I was like, well, let's make animation about Three Musketeers and Count of Monte Cristo and uh, you know Henry V or whatever. So uh, we put a 60 second sizzle reel together. Um, uh, and, and you know what, I'll show it. Let me, let me hey, pop it. Okay. I'll cool. show you the little 60 second sizzle reel that we put together, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and that sizzle reel, what we did uh, was put an entire pitch deck together. Um, and just give me 30 seconds here and I think I'll get it all popped up and you got my screen. Technology. I'll share my screen and then I'll, uh, I'll show you guys a little 60 second scissor reel of what we're, what we're working on. Uh, all right, hopefully uh, my uh, Wi-Fi will be okay. All right, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, yes. Okay, screen sharing. We don't All see right. it. Here we go. Just there a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, again, the idea around this is to create um, animated classics. Okay, this is go. designed for eight to eleven year olds. Here we go. Two households, both alike in dignity. From ancient grudge, break to near mutiny. Peace! You know not what you do! Talk of peace! I hate the word! <laughs> All men, depart! A pair of star-crossed lovers. What lady is that? What is he? Gentleman. His name is Romeo, and the Montague, son of your great enemy. Is she a Capulet? Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo? I know not how to tell thee who I am. Call me but love, and I'll be new baptized. Tibble, Rapture! The prince expressly has forbidden fighting in Verona streets. Oh. I am fortune's fool! So, so, um, so the idea is to create 10 80 minute versions of titles all right so 10 titles 80 minutes a piece package those titles take those that, that package to school districts school districts would then pay a subscription fee 150 bucks a month for access to all 10 of the titles with curriculum along with it now if we were to uh, uh look at new york state eight to 11 year olds that's about 2,000 schools let's just say only 10 percent 
of those schools say, hey, this is a great idea. So 150 bucks times those 200 schools, that's 30K a month that could come into CTH. Of course, there'll be some expenses around it, a sales team and stuff like that. But if you scale that across the United States, and let's even be more conservative, let's just say only 10% of what New York does for the remaining 49 states. Well, that number still equals 150K coming into CTH. Um, but I actually believe that this will be far more successful than 150K. You know, I think um, uh, we have to be very smart about who we team with. So we actually oh, reached out real quick. Let me tell you this last no, no, part. No, I got I to tell you, I'll let you come back in a second. I just have to say, I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And, it made, and what it made me think of was there's a film called Wild Style in which they line up on the basketball court. The kids line yeah. up and fight and everything. So go on now. Finish your, finish your point. Yeah. I just had to say that. So, I'm so excited. So, Michael, Michael, do you remember the short called Hair Love? Do you remember it? It was an Oscar winning short. I think it was 2020 or 2019. And it was a, it was a black father and his black daughter. And he's trying to do her hair. And the yeah. mom, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the mom is actually in the hospital. Uh, uh, battling cancer and she has a smooth pated, you know, top. Anyway, um, the, the producer of that was David Stewart II. David Stewart II said, you know, as I'm trying to pitch him, he was like, you had me at hello. So he <laughs> is partnering with Classical Theater of Harlem. Wow. Uh, they've got the pitch deck ready to go. So now what we're hoping is that we can get in front of these corporations who say Black Lives Matter and all this other stuff and who have these, you know, apparently billions of dollars that are supposed to be set aside to try to, you know, help entrepreneurial folks uh, uh, that are, you know, in this particular space. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get introductions to the, uh, 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 the pitch deck started. And that circling all the way back around, that's work, voiceover work for actors. Uh, there's work for uh, animation, right? And then there's a whole entire world um, that, that I actually am not so aware of, but the fandom world, right? So think Pokemon, you know, where people have cards and all this other stuff, things like that. So there's, there's a chance for expansion here that's huge. Now, obviously we wanna work with folks who, who get the impact that we can make on, you know, the 10 year old version of me, right? You know, that, cause there are those who will be like, well, you know, I wanna know what my, how I'm, you know, of course, uh, with, you know, investors are, are, are welcome, but we're hoping that we can get like sponsorships from, you know, major corporations and stuff like that. So then the money can actually stay within the community and it's not necessarily. For some reason, your, your, your Wi-Fi is breaking up a little bit, but I just want to say that while it's doing that, that in our own image is what you're really talking about, creating images for children of color. Yeah, get yeah. to a room in space where you get better Wi-Fi. Yeah, that yeah. giant New York apartment or wherever yeah, you are. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if you got three kids, you must have a big space. So, I, you know, when I listen to you, Ty, I think to myself, um, there's a whole attitude that CTH puts forward about show business. That there's a whole way of building and creating around the art that has to really be thought about in a, in, a, in a futuristic way. I mean, what you're doing is really important in terms of helping us understand it. It's not just enough put, about putting everything on the stage. It's about thinking in a, in, a, in a way where we're looking up to the future, looking at new ways to bring out a new audience. I mean, COVID was a horrific thing in many ways, but it also made us have to go inside and think about what are the ways we reach people? What are the ways in which we do that? So that's right. what I see with you. Now, there are other programs at uh, CTH that, that, you, that you are doing that are really activists, that are really pushing you forward into the community. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So um, I think... Um, uh, uh, one of the things that we are our pride of doing is to, to try to do everything we possibly can to, um, to to make sure that we're listening to the community. So, you know, um, so many folks have, they're, they're, many of them are artists, they have written things, uh, you know, plays and so on and so forth. And so we have a thing called uh, Playwrights Playground. Uh, right. That's one of our programs. So you could be anybody, literally off the street. All you would have to do is submit 10 to 15 pages of something that you're working on, submit it to our, um, uh, the, the, the woman that's in charge of our literary series. Her name is Sean Renee Graham. And then Sean will, you know, look through. We do get a lot of submissions, so she'll look through. And what we do is that we invite people. Now, mind you, I'm talking about pre-COVID now, so we're going to hopefully get back to this soon. But the idea is you submit your work. We invite, a, 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 you know, a, a, a people 
to come to the evening, and usually we have anywhere between 30 to 50 people, sometimes even bigger than that. And then we cast the people from the people who have shown up into the piece that you're working on. So you get a chance to listen to something that you've written. So it, it, it's one of these things where, you know, we're trying to be mindful that who knows, uh, the next Dominique Morisot could be in that in that uh, in that audience. Just oh, trying more things out. She is. So. It's not. She might be. You know, it's like Frank Silvera Writers Workshop. It's like that's Frank right. Hudson did. It's like it's like developing the writers in in Harlem, the community with stories to tell and giving them a space and a place to tell their stories. I think that's so important. Yeah. And one of the things that hits me about you know classical theater of Harlem, you you benefit eighteen thousand New Yorkers yearly with your with what you do with the programming you do with your outreach. Yeah. Uh, your project classics is also an interesting uh, yeah. program for you. So yeah, uh, yeah, thank you for you know acknowledging all that. So yeah, so uh, just to kind of lay it down. So yeah, we have our annual productions, right? Usually um, they're pretty critically acclaimed. We're happy about that. Um, and you guys know that I said before. Oftentimes they are you know you know in the classical canon. They're revivals. They're American. Okay, I'm going to be so rude. Too. I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt you because you're you know no critically acclaimed. Five oh, Lucille Lortel Awards, five Obie Awards, Drama Desk Awards for Artistic Excellence 2004, Drama Desk nomination, Best Actors, Drama Desk nomination for Outstanding Musical Revival, Edwin Booth Award for Music. Okay, I will yeah. name one of eight theaters to watch in America by Drama League. Okay, go on, go right. on, Ty, go on. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, so yes, we. In, in addition to that, we have educational programming where we go to public schools. Um, and as a matter of fact, anyone on this chat right now, if you know of a school that is in need of theatrical arts, please let us know. Uh, my, my, uh, I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, we right now are looking for schools so uh, that we can bring our teaching artists into to you know support a, the a theater arts program. So uh, we have future classics, and these are new plays or musicals written by you know folks of color, black, Afro Caribbean, Latinx, whatever artists of color. And basically, what we call a future classic is a play that we think will, would be a classic, um, um, and it just needs to stand the test of time. That's it. Um, we uh, and 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 of course, you know, the, uh, I hope you guys have been watching some of our digital programming uh, over the last year. Everything we're trying to do right now is tethered. Uh, we're trying to tether everything to the Harlem Renaissance. We're calling it Renaissance Reborn. And the idea is essentially what I said before, is that a um, 100 years ago, uh, folks were under siege. And I get a feeling that a lot of folks feel very similarly, particularly in, in many parts of Harlem, and that we need to look to one another. And, you know, arts uh, was arguably the way in which um, those people did come together. So I am somebody who believes we need to come together. We need to bring our audiences back and we need to be able to have, we're, we're social beings. And um, to work against that, I think is um, uh, antithetical to what it is to be human. So I am, I am all for us getting back together in the theater, in any sort of, of space where um, we can start building this ecosystem again. Uh, I'm gonna get you in trouble. I'm gonna get you in trouble, I hope. Right. So your three boys, three boys, right? Yeah, no, I have a boy and two girls. Okay, your boy yeah. and two girls. Yeah. What's been their favorite show at Classical Theater of Harlem? Good question. I think, um, uh, uh, I don't know. I actually don't know. They probably love Christmas Carol in Harlem because yeah. two of them were in it. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Um, my older one was able to really get Three Musketeers. Uh, we had some really, you know, great acrobatics that that was led by Manny Brown, who was our fight choreographer. So they really loved all that and the sword play. So, um, so yeah, yeah, they 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 keep us busy. That's for it sure. Sounds to me like you're doing shows that you love too. Sounds like kids oh, yeah. can love it. You love it. That the Classical Theater Harlem is really yeah. for the whole. I mean, I've seen very serious shows there. That yeah. Really, you know, are, are are for adults and mature. But I also have seen shows. Where I feel like it's really for young people to understand and to see a whole different way of thinking about their culture and who they are. And, and, and speaking, oh, I was going to say, speaking of which, why don't I just give you a quick little uh, taste of some of the things over the years? Is that all right? Be great, man. Please. All right, I'll do that. Let me uh, go back to the little screen share again, and um, here we go. Uh, hopefully, you know, Wi-Fi holds up. So this is just a little bit of a taste of some of the things we did over the years. Great.
Wow. You know, my favorite moment, you're gonna, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but I loved it when you when you were strangling someone. And I thought to myself, so I'm sure that's how you feel sometimes when you're talking to funders and they want to give you money for this, but you need money for that. I'm just wondering yeah. if, how, how do you balance that? How do you work that out to help people understand what the what the arts really need as opposed to what the, the administration thinks it would want to give you? Yeah, so you are, you're gonna get me in trouble. So, um, <laughs> So I, I think the uh, struggle that 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 funders have is that um, I think they're probably given a set of of like bullet points of what they're looking for, and if they relate to that for themselves personally, I think the checks get written. But if they don't really relate to it, or if they are of the mind that you know what CTH is doing or or companies like us is sort of community theater, well then um, there's probably a pocket of money for those kinds of things, you know. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's hard for me to complain about it. You know, people before me worked hella harder than I did, Woody King and all those folks, you know what I mean? So uh, at the end of the day, I'm hoping that I can find a way to enroll those folks to understand, especially now, that what you've been giving us, we love. We need double that. And the reason why isn't because I'm trying to be Lincoln Center or any of the, I'm not really, I'm not. What I want to do is create. Um, be able to have time to plan over the years and create a sustainable model. And part of that, truthfully, is trying to figure out a way to create uh, our own earned income. Uh, and because, look, if we figure out a way to get our own earned income, Michael, uh, of course, I'll still ask for all that foundation money. <laughs> but we will have we, it, there's, there's a self-determined way yes. of going about um, making sure that you're around for the next hundred years when you can make mm -hmm. your own money and do it for yourself. Now, um, uh, well, it there's, sounds you know, to me like you're trying to get a theater or something. Yeah, we, we're trying to do that as well because we know that if you actually have a, some real estate, right? If you actually have a home, even right. the funders look at you differently because that, yeah. that's a sign of stability. And right now, you know, real estate in New York is very difficult. We specifically want to be in Harlem. And, um, it's you know, we, we do want a home. It's going to be a challenge to get it. It's extraordinarily expensive. We've done some feasibility studies. You know, we're looking at... Um, one feasibility study we worked out, it was like $75 million. But one of the things that we are thinking through is that I, I'm not interested in this for Classical Theater of Harlem as some sort of vanity project. Right. So we've reached out to uh, some other venerable institutions like Harlem Chamber Players and Harlem Opera. And the idea is that all three of our organizations would be able to find a place together where we could be anchors in a space um, so that, you know, you heard me say it earlier, the 10 year old version of us can walk into and know that we have the, the, the best of the best um, uh, that that's, you know, been part and parcel of Harlem. I mean, when Harlem was at its zenith, it informed the culture of the world. Black culture informs the culture of the world. So I want us to be able to still be able to do that in a way, you know, um, uh, without apology. Well, you know, you're doing what Bob Cole, 1900 and. James Rosamond Johnson, James Weldon Johnson. They were James all Weldon about Johnson. building theater, about building audiences, helping people understand our culture through what we do and who we are. And when you talked about, I mean, Bob Cole in, uh, was trying to get a Broadway theater in the 1890s. Oh, wow. You know, African-American man who had worked in the theater and had successful shows, was blackballed for a while, but he didn't tour the shows in Canada. So we've always had to figure out ways to, yeah. you know, survive and go. And then in, uh, I should just mention that in 1921, Shuffle Along, which changed all of American music uh, and musicals, 18, 1921, 1821, 100 years of incredible progress. And now we have Classical Theater of Harlem really creating um, a whole new way of thinking about what the possibilities are. I mean, you know, we have the National Black Theater Festival, in yes. Washington, which has been wonderful. It's been 30 years of that festival. And in 2022, it's going to come back after having take, taken a pause with COVID. But I look at Classical Theater of Harlem and I think it offers a whole different way of um, being active in the culture. And really- so one of the, I'm glad really you said that because there is something specific about what you're saying that I wanted to touch upon is that I actually do want to essentially right size our organization, right? So that means that there's sort of a ceiling, if you will, right? We can call it a soft ceiling, but the idea is that it's going to be of a certain size. Maybe it's a three to four, maybe a three to $5 million a year organization, but then we can be a template for other organizations so that they can replicate that in other innovative communities. Because, you know, the idea that we have just the, these big institutions, well, the, the more money, that goes to these big institutions, all of a sudden these big institutions are going to be the ones that get to decide what art is. 
and the art is actually created amongst the community. So if there are, if there is a healthy ecosystem of of, of arts presenters across the United States, um, I hope that CTH could be an example on how to build that. That that's what I ultimately hope we can be. Well, thank so. you. I see Meredith joining us now, and I'm hoping that she is going to bring us some questions and some thank things to talk that's about. That's exactly here. what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. You. Um, Ty. Well, I, yes. Yes. Um, question for you. Has your role or how do you see your role, um, how has it changed in the community um, over the last few years during the pandemic? How has my role or changed? Or has it? No, as a matter of fact, no, it's just, um, it's gotten just, things are that much more difficult because of the decisions that are being made around COVID. So yeah, uh, um, I have to admit, I do a lot more, uh, uh, I'm, I'm much more, plugged into the, the, the administrative side and fundraising than I am the art like I love to do. So I do, I, but, but you know, I don't know if it's changed so much. It's just definitely has grown. So yes, I guess it's fair to say there's a little bit of change there, but um, you know, I, I, I want people to understand this is that, you know, there are a lot of institutions that were able to get that shuttered venues money. And mm -hmm. that was significant, you know, sometimes 10 million bucks. Well, we don't have a venue, right? We did get PPP, we got it twice. That allowed me to extend the runway no one got furloughed. Everyone kept their uh, kept their health insurance. And look, let's let's just be crystal clear. Those other big institutions, they have you know scores of employees. Okay, we don't have that many. But with that said, now that as we ramp up to start doing things, the cost of everything has gone up. I am actually in the middle of my budget right now, and we are twenty five percent higher than we were the year before. Twenty five percent. The cost of the wood for me to build sets. You know, I've got to pay people more because. Of the bigger institutions are paying more and they're pulling out talent from CTH, you know, not that we own, don't get me wrong. I hope you guys get where I'm coming from. But, but at the end of the day, uh, in order for me to, to, to stay along that line of sustainability, we need resources to make that happen. And, you know, um, you know, I'm determined to find a way that, that resources can come into CTH where we're not so dependent uh, uh, on these other foundations because uh, maybe foundations have other uh, have other thoughts about how their money should be used. You know, I don't well, know. You what know, I, just to, I mean, to, to come in on that, it's that CTH, New Federal Theater, New Heritage Theater. These are the feeders for these organizations to create and make space for African-American talent and talent artists of color. Right. I mean, you know, we think that Denzel started uh, at, at, at uh, New Federal Theater and Asi and... Ruby started American Negro Theater. These small companies are really the feeders. And, and what we want to do is make it possible for people to stay and make a living in. Right. So in I've also got to make sure that the Denzels and stuff that come out of here yeah. understand that they got to come back. Yes. Understand that they got to make, you know, contributions to us because what tends to happen when you become the Denzels or whomever, mm -hmm. you give money to Carnegie Hall, you give money to Lincoln. And I'm like, ah, you know, <laughs> well, you know. Yeah. And that's, and that's part of our that's part of our issue tribally yeah. that we have to understand that yes you could give money to the church and that's wonderful and please I'm not saying don't give money to that that's church. right yeah don't do that I'm yeah. saying the but church. our theaters are our churches Amen. our theaters you know let's give as much to our theaters as we do to our football games or to our you know there's out things like that because the theater is the cultural literacy yes. for, for us as a people to to really understand where we are and how we think we're seeing it. More and more. I mean, one of the things that, you know, we just had Dominique Morisot's play Skeleton Crew uh, on Broadway. We had a Detroit night because it's set in Detroit and the factory is closing down. And it was really an amazing experience to see all these Detroiters who live in New York coming out to experience that. And that's that same spirit is what you get when you're at CTH with the community there, but the community of New York. People from all, one of the best things about watching your sizzle reel we're seeing that you have actors of all colors on the stage, yeah. which people are not used to looking at in New York, which is unfortunate. You can see productions that are monochromatic. And so one of the things that CTH has really done for us is make us understand what Joe Papp understood, what the theater, African Grove Theater understood, is that theater is for everyone to experience, to see, but also to participate in. And, and Harlem, let's be crystal clear, was the most welcoming community for over 100 years. Yes. People came up to Harlem because they felt more alive, you know what I mean? Uh, very strong within the uh, uh, gay community. A lot of those folks that, that we all talk about, they were the ones, they were the vanguards of, of the voices of the gay community. Um, so, you know. Um, okay, Michael, I have to ask you. I, met, been, I know, forgive me, um, 
I, I just want to ask you one question. There is okay. one thing I've always, always admired about you is that you, you, um, the way you comport yourself around this stuff, because I do find myself, you know, my temperature getting raised a bit, you know, dealing with some of this stuff. Tell me, tell me how you have found a way to approach this where you do comport yourself in a way that no matter what you, you persevere. And, and what I think sometimes, um, it, it's like swimming upstream. Well, I'm going to give you two things. Okay. First of all, thank you. I'm honored that you think that my husband, Vincent might think differently, but I'm okay. glad that that's what you, you know, that, that he's like that. I'm going to give you two. One is a quote I keep in my head. Mm. Angels, angels fly because they take themselves so lightly. Angels fly because they take themselves so lightly. But the other one is a conversation I had today with Michelle Hodges. Yeah. We talked about stoicism and the idea of, I cannot do anything if I'm angry or upset. Right. And in fact, the more you try to anger me and upset me, the more I should calm down and be focused on why you're trying to do that instead of letting me get what I need to get. Okay. And okay. so that would be, and Ty, I have to say, I admire your passion. I'm like looking at you going like, I got to get more like that. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's a, it's a symbiotic trade-off. And, uh, and, you know, and I'm a few years older than you, too. So, I mean, I think well, I'm, I a, I'm the ARP, you know, so yeah. that might be part of it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I mean, I mean, it's great because, like, you know, there are people in my family that I really, truly believe. I, I was I was raised by women. My, I have a very big matriarchal family, huge extended family. Lived with my auntie for a little while while my mother was uh, in basic training for the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. and And I really, truly believe that I have at least a half a dozen aunties and stuff that could easily have been Oprah. But anger got in the way, they, yeah, you know, right. and I understood why they were angry. I get it, you know, and but but, you know, I, there is there is a I don't know. What's the word skill? There's something to it. There's something to it where uh, I admire because well, um, it's fly. one of those. Angels fly because they yeah. take themselves so lightly. I gotcha. mean, if you just think about that, that thing. I don't think I'm an angel. But, right. you know, I mean, or I can quote Arthur Balfour, who said nothing matters very much and very little matters at all. Yeah. So it's really important to think about what really matters and what, what, is really my, what am I trying to achieve here? But I just have to say, I respect all the steps you've taken, all the initiatives you've created that have really opened up classical theater Harlem in a way that it, 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 wasn't even under, it wasn't even thought of that way. It was just putting things on stage. And now it's become an institution, it's become part of the Harlem community. And I just applaud you for the vision and for the clarity of your vision and for your passion and going forward with that vision. That's what I have to say about you. Know, so. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I've got another question for you. Charlie. Sure, sure, go ahead, sorry. Um, that's okay, you guys are both passionate. We love it. It's, it's really engaging. Um, yeah. What organizations offer models for your and the person says, I would ask about partners, but you already mentioned Harlem Chamber Players and Harlem Opera. Um, okay. Forgive me, my Wi-Fi. You said what organizations? One more time. What organization offers? What organizations offer models for your vision? So you know the things that you're planning to do with Classical Theater of Harlem. Are there yeah. other organizations that you want to model um, what you're doing after? So I, I think that's a fantastic question. This is the best way I can answer that. What I tried to do when I took over CTH is talk to people who were working in successful institutions, even the the big ones like the public. You know, talk to Oscar. Talk to. Um, Joe Dowling over at the Guthrie, uh, Lou Bellamy. Uh, so I, I talked to a lot of folks and I, my, I only had one main question. What doesn't work? That's all I need. Tell me what doesn't work. So I didn't repeat those sort of same mistakes. And I think from all this information, I've been able to sort of craft where I think um, what makes sense for a, pro uh, a producing organization, especially one in a, in a domain where the economics really don't make much sense. You know, we have to be like these... Um, these cheerleaders. We have to be these chief cheerleaders of our organizations in order for money to come in, which is great. But then that it becomes sort of a, a cult of personality. And, and that's one of the things I think tends to be a mistake. I don't want this to be the Ty Jones Theater. It needs to be the classical theater of Harlem. It has to be a brand that lives on its own. I cannot remain the uh, producing artistic director, you know, until I can't walk anymore. It needs to move on. Some new blood needs to come in with different ideas. And, you know, and then my job would be to try to make sure we maintain the folks who we've been able to wrangle over the past few years. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so what what I did is I took an, it's basically an amalgam of several things to try to mash it up together to to create uh, a sustainable right sized institution. 
that hopefully other people can, can model uh, in creating a, an ecosystem of institutions. Wow. Well, one thing that you make me think of, right, when you say all that, I think, you know, forgive me for this, but where there is no vision, the people perish. And what you're talking about is, a, is mission, vision, understanding what you need to do, and then putting the pieces in place yeah. to make it happen. So I just have to say I, that's that's really key. Yeah. And, I just and, and applaud you for that. Well, thank you. And, and let's be crystal clear, could not be done by myself. Our board chair that I have right now, his name is Patrick Bradford. Oh, one yeah. of the most theater literate people I've ever been around in my life. And then he just happens to be this like high powered lawyer as well, too. So he'll he'll talk you to death. But um, <laughs> but in a no, good way. Though. Wait a minute. That's better yeah. than he flew in from London when I was doing the Hatch Billups collection. He flew in that day to hear me talk and be interviewed See? and he fell asleep. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, feel that. I mean, it was fine because I guess I wasn't that exciting. But yeah. the point but, is that he got off a plane and, and came, came to, to a theater me. event. Yeah. And that was that's how Patrick is. Patrick is going to yes. always show up no so, matter what. So that's, yeah. so you are and blessed. So I'm, I'm real blessed to have somebody like him because the truth is, I think somebody like him helps people take us more seriously. And that's the way this is going to go. I'm an actor. That's what I mainly do. That's how I make my living. And, um, and I just think that there is a, a sort of an already always vision of what an actor is. And the idea that an actor could lead an organization just doesn't, isn't embedded in one's mind. But um, so then when you have somebody like Patrick, who, you know, uh, who can speak the Queen's English, all right? But he's also from Alabama, so if he needs to get down and dirty, he will. You know what I mean? Yes. But when you have somebody like that in your corner, you know, I, you know, I'm five nine on a good day. I feel like I'm ten feet tall when he's around. You know what I mean? And I've got you know, good team. Uh, my my team around me, my staff and stuff like that. Has, it's been extraordinary. They take a lot off my shoulders. They know I'm a dad and a husband, and they Ty, I got this. You know, um, so I, I feel really lucky. It's hard to keep people just because you know not-for-profit doesn't pay as uh, as much and i've got people on my team that could work anywhere in corporate america and be killing it right now you know what i mean they really could be killing it uh, financially at least so i, I feel lucky on because i can't do it by myself I'm, uh, it's it's not possible i think early on I, I i had the energy and the drive and stuff like that to do a number of things so i, I was the managing director development director uh, the i was the board chair i did do all of it but now it's at a point where it, it only behooves me to allow that help to come in. And, and especially as we try to find a space, that world of real estate, it's like sharks in the water and, it, and the water's blood. It, it's, it's the strangest thing, I tell you. Um, well, thank you, thank you. That's this yeah, amazing. Sorry, I, kind of get on, I, get, I get on a little no, rant. It's beautiful, man, thank you. It's the passion. That's why you're so popular. Um, I have one last question here. Sure. Um, so one of our attendees is asking, how do you imagine um, the venue for classical theater of Harlem that you've been talking about? Yeah. Um, how, well, is it, how big is it? You know, what, do you, what are you envisioning? So um, the truth is, is that a lot of the vision is going to probably depend upon the space that we actually find. But this is the idea. First of all, I want it to be in Harlem proper. OK, uh, that, that's one. Uh, the other part is, is that I want it to be a space that uh, there are more than one anchor partner. So I don't want this to be the, you know, Little Island, which is awesome, but it's, you know, it's Barry Diller. And I don't want it to be the Pearlman, which is a half a billion dollar project, you know, but it, but it's, um, you know, it's, the per it's Ron Pearlman, right? Um, I want this to be uh, uh, like the Harlem Classical Arts Complex, right? That's what this is about. And, um, you know, right now, the first iteration that we were going for was... Um, uh, uh, along the corridor next to Harlem School of the Arts. And the idea was to have a five-story building with uh, two theaters, a 199 theater in there, a 99-seat theater, rehearsal space on the floor, another space that's uh, uh, for offices. Um, and, you know, and the theater would, have, uh, would essentially be two floors. It would have a little bit of fly space. So, you know, we'll see. Th those are the kinds of things that, that I would like to have happen. Um, and hopefully we can get some, you know, political support and some very rich people support behind us to make something like this happen. Um, but we're prepared to be the anchors for something like that. And uh, uh, and no other time other than now to try. You already are the anchor for things like Sounds that. Sounds fantastic. All right. I think. I well, know Michael, yeah, you have to go. We know. Yeah. Keep so, talking, folks. This is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I'm so grateful. for That was my last question. Oh, 
Well, Michael, man, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It is, a, it is. A, I'm humbled that you would say yes to this, and I just right. thank you for, and I can't wait to do it again. Can't wait to see you in person. Well, let's make that happen soon. I can't we wait to come see, you know, seize the king. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, hey, listen, yeah. everybody, real quick. Are, are you gonna, you gonna ready to go, Michael? I'll wait. Okay. Okay. So, just want to let everybody know, March 5th, we are gonna have a, a small fundraiser. It's a comedy show in Harlem. Go to our website uh, uh, tomorrow. You'll see all the information. So if y'all like comedy, uh, you come to the comedy club. It'll be in Harlem March fifth, and uh, you know the the money that we had at the door, a portion that goes to CTH. We're also going to bring back our poker tournament, our poker oh, tournament, our uh, up, up, uh, uh, uptown poker tournament. That'll be May twenty sixth. Um, uh, yeah, again, it'll be on our website. But the idea is that you know. We're trying to expand things out to those bankers and them lawyers who like to do that kind of stuff. So Play May twenty sixth, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, so, and that too will be uptown here in Harlem. We'll probably do it at the Harlem WeWork or Harlem Collective. Uh, but again, we'll make sure all the information uh, is on the website. And lastly, remember this summer, directed by Carl Cofield, Twelfth Night. We're, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna make sure that this is gonna be the play to, to watch this summer. So out in the park, free, uh, and it is. There are no barriers to access. It will be free at Marcus Garvey Park the entire month of July. Thank you. All Fabulous. Right. We'll Thank you so much, begin. Ty and Michael. This was a really fantastic discussion. Um, for those of you who are still on, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, please consider making a donation to the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum and the Classical Theater of Harlem okay. um, to continue to enable us to do uh, what we do and offer these great free public programs. Um, so I'd just like to remind everyone that tonight is our second of four um, conversations and are talking about race matters. Join the conversation series. Join us here every Wednesday at six o'clock on Zoom. Be sure to register through the links in the chat and follow us on social media for updates. We will see you next Wednesday, which is February 23rd at 6 p.m. for Flow E Movimiento in the Heights, Social Justice and Advocacy in High School by Susan Natacha Gonzalez and Beatriz Oliva. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening.